Is there any evidence that harmony, or even polyphony, was used in ancient music? Well, according to the musicologist Kurt Sachs, the deep-rooted prejudice that harmony and polyphony have been a prerogative of the medieval and modern West does not hold water. Not one of the continents, not one of the archipelagos between them, lacks rudimentary forms of polyphony. That's from Kurt Sachs' book, The Rise of Music in the Ancient World, East and West. And as I will argue with ample supporting evidence, it is indeed nothing more than an urban myth spun by the Western world that only monophony existed in ancient music. I will explore some of the reasons why this frankly ridiculous, unchallenged, dismal dogma developed in the first place. Reasons which seem so deep-rooted that the dogma is still being taught in most musical studies to the present day. Indeed, I have often read in various musicological art articles that all ancient music was monophonic, with no harmony. They claim, for example, that the left hand of the lyre player was simply used to dampen the strings, just as harp players do today to remove any unwanted sustain. And the left hand played no part in adding harmony to the melody being played with the plectrum in the right hand. However, these blanket assertions are always cited by boffins who have never actually played a lyre, therefore know nothing of the incredibly diverse palette of lyre playing techniques. In my own personal extensive experience of gradually mastering and composing for the recreated lyres of antiquity, I have discovered by actual experience that unlike the harp, due to the smaller size of the lyre, there is virtually no unwanted sustain. Indeed, on the lower tension gut or natural fibre strings used in antiquity, there would be even less sustain than, say, on the um, nylon harp strings I have on some of my more modern lyres. Therefore, the left hand of the lyre player, in my opinion, was much more likely used to provide basic harmonic accompaniment. For example, plucking fourths and fifths to accompany a melody being played with the um, right hand plectrum. Or, or another alternative use of the left hand is to use it in the block and strum style of lyre playing technique. A technique still used in Africa today, where the lyre has been continually played since antiquity. This entails um, creating basic chords um, that can be strummed on the lyre, just like on an acoustic guitar, by blocking with the left hand only notes not required to sound, and leaving open only those strings which are to be strummed with the plectrum. Indeed, this ancient string blocking technique of lyre playing can still be heard today, for example, in the Kara lyre playing musicians of Eritrea and Ethiopia in East Africa. Indeed, the lyres of antiquity were so obviously designed to be played with two hands. And indeed, um, for example, in ancient Greece, they even constructed a special strap specifically for this purpose, um, that you could support the lyre while you're playing it with two hands. And the strap for the left hand was called the telemann. The timeless fusion of melody and basic harmonic accompaniment is universal and any ancient musician with an ounce of musical imagination would realise very quickly that specific notes on the lyre sound very pleasant when played together in harmony. Um, let's have a look at some um, more evidence to, to support the idea that harmony is a perfectly natural thing. Um, harmony exists, and even polyphony exists, in ancient Aboriginal African cultures who have been isolated from the rest of the superior Western world since time immemorial. Um, um, the views of certain musicologists that the ancients had no understanding of the use of harmony, again, is just an urban myth by the West in the relentless efforts to discredit the more primitive music of other cultures. A claim totally unfounded and is clearly false. And indeed, if you search YouTube, for the amazing complex polyphonic singing of the Aka Pygmies of Central Africa, it sounds like an African version of Monteverdi, it's amazing. And this culture has been completely untainted in any way by the so-called superior music of the Western world. So the use of harmony in music was not simply some clever Western invention of the Renaissance. Harmony has and always will occur perfectly naturally. And that is simply due to the eternal a priori laws of physics. 
which um, which result in the fact that specific musical intervals will always blend together due to the symmetry, the mathematical symmetry of how their respective sound waveforms always interact with each other. For example, due to the symmetry of how so the sound waves of two notes forming the pure musical interval of a fifth interact, a musical fifth will always and has always sounded pure just as the three sides of a triangle always and will always add up to 180 degrees. And moving on to the real concrete evidence for the use of harmony in, in antiquity, there are ancient writings, lots of them, which mention the use of harmony and even polyphony, especially in ancient Greece. The use of consonant intervals such as the fifth and the fourth to sweeten a melodic line is mentioned several times in ancient texts. Um, for example, the author Pseudo Longinus, um, in a Roman era Greek work of literary criticism dating, from, dating to around the first century AD, called On the Sublime, asserts that the melody is usually sweetened by two paraphonic intervals, the fifth and the fourth. And as Kurt Sachs says about this, this is an unmistakable testimony to the frequent use, not of functional chords in the modern sense, but to be sure, of consonant notes, just as in East Asiatic, Babylonian, Egyptian and medieval music. Um, and again, con leaving a commentary on the writing of Pseudo Longinus, Sachs continues, Pseudo Longinus, who probably wrote in the first century AD, is a comparatively late witness that is to the use of um, the use of consonant intervals to create a complement to melody. As we know from Plutarch, even those he called the ancients played C in consonants with F, the higher E, both in consonant in dissonance with C and B in consonants with A and G. Such rudimentary harmony must have been the rule, for Plutarch relates that those music musicians who opposed the enharmonic genus put it to the incompatibility of quarter tones with consonants. The enharmonic genus was an ancient Greek scale which um, used these very, very tight sounding um, quarter tones. So, the use of consonant fourths and fifths, for me personally, was intuitive. Um, an intuitive technique whose effectiveness, whose effectiveness I very soon realised while I was teaching myself to play my very first lyre. I used to use my left hand to provide basic consonant intervals like fourths and fifths as a nice clear accompaniment to sweeten the melodic line which I was plucking with a plectrum in my right hand. Moving on to the writings of the ancient Greek philosopher Aristotle, it is also clearly stated that strings on the kithara, that's the large um, wooden lyre played by the professional music, professional musicians of ancient Greece, were always sounded together. And to quote from Aristotle's Problems, book 12, line 12, why is it that the lower two strings, the lower of two strings, always has the tune? If one omits the paramis, then one should sound it with the mes. The tune is there nonetheless, but if one omits the mes, then one should strike both, the tune is missing. Um, in a commentary about this little passage, by the, um, the author Robert Fink explains, this quote seems more than clear that two notes, and not just one at a time, were usually struck on the kithara's strings. During the 3rd to 4th century CE, we come across the writer on music, Gaudemistus, who describes the use of harmony in strikingly modern terms. If symphonic notes sound together on stringed or wind instruments, the lower one in relation to the higher one, and the higher in relation to the lower one, form a unit. We call them symphonic, as the two notes melt into oneness. More evidence from ancient Greece. Not only of harmony, but evidence of polyphony. About the clearest example of an ancient Greek text which clearly describes polyphony as we know it today is mentioned in the pseudo-Aristotelian book Pericosmo, which probably dates to around the 1st century CE, and to quote, Music mixes high and low, 
short and long notes in different voice parts to achieve one harmony. As Kurt Sachs says in describing this passage, it would scarcely be possible to find a clearer example of what we call a mixed two-part counterpoint. The existence of some sort of polyphony is also certainly hinted at in the writings of the Greek philosopher Plato. Um, in his book Laws, that's um, book 7, section 812d, when in describing how a music teacher should best teach young boys from the age of 9 to 12 years old to sing and play the lyre, Plato advises that he should merely double the melodic line on his own lyre in order to avoid the florid use of harmony and counterpoint, which presumably must have been the most common actual performance practice of the time. And to quote from Plato in his Laws, The teacher and the learner ought to use the sounds of the lyre because its notes are pure. The player who teaches and his pupil rendering note for note in unison, but complexity and variation of notes when the strings give one sound and the poet or the composer of the melody gives another, in other words, counterpoint, also when they make concords and harmonies in which lesser and greater intervals, slow and quick, or high and low notes are combined, again, polyphony, or again, when they make complex variations of rhythm which they adapt to the notes of the lyre, all this thing is not suited to those who have to acquire a speedy and useful knowledge of music in just three years. For opposite principles are confusing and create a difficulty in learning, and our young men should learn quickly, and their mere necessary acquirements are not few or trifling. As will be shown in due course, let the Director of Education attend to the principles concerning music we are laying down. In other words, keep things really straightforward to your absolute beginner. But in describing that, he also describes this amazing, forgotten, diverse palette of harmony and um, polyphony that was practiced in ancient Greece. Other intuitive reasons why harmony existed in antiquity. For example, the lyre players of antiquity must have had an understanding of the correct sound of specific musical intervals when played together simultaneously in harmony in order to tune their lyres in the first place. <laughs> the fact remains that the ancients were far more advanced in musical theory and harmony than this curious urban myth of the urban the urban myth of the monotony of monophony in the ancient world would ever have us believe. Um, it's just incredible, absolutely incredible. Um, other instruments besides the lyres of antiquity also clearly show they were designed for the use of harmony, or even imply the use of harmony. And the best example of this in ancient times is the double orlos, or the double flute. And a double orlos, or a double flute, in the case of the orlos, that was two pipes with two sets of finger holes, with one mouthpiece, so we could play through the reed two melodies at the same time. And the same with double flutes. They had one mouthpiece, but two pipes with two sets of fingers on each pipe. So by definition, these instruments play two pictures simultaneously in harmony. Hey presto. And the use of double pipes is extremely archaic. For example, double pipes of silver were discovered along with the amazingly ancient golden lyre of ore, dating back to 2600 BC. <laughs> the use of harmony was perfectly well established several centuries before the pyramids of ancient Egypt were even conceived. Other intuitive examples of the use of harmony um, include the use of musical ensembles put together by composers, presumably, throughout the ancient world. Um, indeed, there are ample archaeological artefacts which illustrate complete musical ensembles being formed throughout the whole of the ancient world. Now, in trying to evaluate the evidence of my theory that harmony was used in ancient times, now according to Occam's Razor, it is more reasonable to assume, sorry, is it more reasonable to, is it more reasonable to assume that all these different musicians and their unique combination of instruments with so many different colourful timbres and different pictures were put together merely to play in mind-numbing and monotonous unison? I don't think so. Given all the facts, I think it is a far simpler 
theory to suggest that given the tireless imagination and inspiration which is unique to the human artistic spirit, no matter what the era, that composers of antiquity form these intricate construction of musical ensembles formed with so many different instruments of so many different timbres and pitches to combine their unique tones and pitches together through the basic use of harmony, polyphony, antiphony, heterophony and probably even counterpoint just as we do right through to the modern day. There is nothing different about musical imagination 5,000 years ago to the mind of a musician today. We have the same software, nothing has changed in human evolution in the space of 5,000 years. Um, and here are some examples of uh, musical ensembles you can see from antiquity. For example, um, going back to ancient Egypt, you have musical ensembles of fretted lutes and double flutes from around 1200 BC. Um, going to the um, ancient Near East from from a, ba a bas relief from the ruins of the palace in Nineveh that shows um, harpists playing in a procession with, with these shoulder harps and um, double flute or reed players. And looking at this um, amazing bas relief, which I say is preserved in the British Museum, note the position of the hands of the harpists. If they're all supposed to be playing in unison, according to the urban myth of the monotony of monophony in the ancient world, then all the harpists would be depicted with their hands in exactly the same position. This is clearly not the case, they're all playing different notes at the same time, in harmony. So what is um, the actual reason for this strange urban myth of the monotony of monophony in the ancient world? I think it's something to do um, with a simple logical category mistake in misinterpreting the first codification of the practice of polyphony and how to create it, which we find in the Musica Incariadis treaties of the late 9th century, and the first conception and practice of um, polyphony, which is, goes back as long as people have been singing, we look back at the Acapygmies and things like that. And this same sort of um, error can easily be made, this sort of logical error can be made, um, say, for example, in identifying the first ar archaeological record of the existence of musical instruments with the first actual use of that instrument, and they're not the same. Um, just as the first codification of harmony and the actual first um, conception idea of harmony are not the same thing. They're completely logically different. And an example of, say, the first archaeological record of an instrument would be, say, the lyre of all the gold and silver lyres of ore, which dates back to almost 5,000 years. But these lyres are incredibly advanced instruments uh, made of um, silver and um, highly intricate. And there was no doubt earlier, simpler prototypes of these lyres played for centuries before these magnificent instruments were finally created, but sadly, none of the prototypes have survived. The first, appearance of, the first appearance of a musical instrument in the archaeological record is not the same as the first actual creation of that instrument, just as um, the first codification of harmony is not the same as the first conception, the first idea of using harmony. And indeed, since human voices, both male and female, all differ in pitch, the emergence of harmony and polyphony to musically merge these different available pitches together is perfectly natural and therefore must be almost as ancient as the practice of singing itself. It is indeed monophony which is unnatural. <laughs>